So my name is John Prawl. I'm a commercial technical support engineer for Improco, and I've got about 12 years experience in the refrigeration industry uh, with a Bachelor of Science degree from Rochester Institute of Technology. Richard Baer currently is serving as the systems engineering manager for Thermo Fisher Scientific Laboratory products in their cold storage business unit out of Asheville, North Carolina. And he has 17 years of experience in the design of ULT applications. Come on up, Richard. All right, so welcome to the first hydrocarbon variable speed ULT freezer. So this is a cooling solution for a uh, very temperature sensitive product. Uh, OSHA low refrigeration uh, is generally used in the medical application. So you'll see biomedical equipment in there, chemical equipment, and some specialty products. Uh, this type of product is an extremely high value product. Um, you can have uh, in a single refrigerator that's about 25 cubic feet, let's say, you could have about a million dollars of product or somewhere in that range uh, of value in there. So uh, if one of these systems is not maintaining temperature properly or it goes down, you have a tremendous amount of product loss. Um, so typically, these systems are run in a cascade arrangement. Um, but you're going to be operating at temperatures between minus 90 and minus 70 C. Um, so on the high side, you're going to have one circuit that is cascaded against another uh, refrigeration circuit that runs at a lower temperature. Um, historically, these systems have used R404A and R508B, which are very high GWP HFCs. Um, uh, and these, these, the 508B would be on the low side, and the 404A would be on the high side. Um, so stage one, which is your 404A side, would typically condense at worst case around 40 degrees Celsius um, and evaporate at minus 35 C. And then cascade that against the other system, which will condense at minus 25 C and evaporate at down to around minus 90 C. Um, the issue with this system is that there's too much lift to do with a single compressor, so that's why we're using them in a cascade arrangement. Um, some of the challenges around here is that these gases are very high GWP, um, so we want to look at moving into a lower GWP type of gas, and we need to improve the energy efficiency of these systems. Um, when you're running down at such low temperatures, the energy consumption of these systems is very, very high compared to your standard refrigerator uh, running at normal temperatures. So, first of all, we take a look at switching to a natural refrigerant, um, which in this case, we're going to use R290 on the high side and R170 on the low side. Both of these are hydrocarbon type refrigerants. So, the, uh, the, the baseline design using the HFC refrigerants had a, GW, or a, a power consumption of 880 watts, and the second stage was around 550 watts. Just by switching gases, those numbers theoretically should drop to 720 watts and 500 watts, which is a, a, a COP improvement of around 17%, just by changing gases. And then if you take a look at from a GWP standpoint, 404A with it being around 4,000 GWP, and 508B is 13,000 GWP. We're moving to gases that are three and six, respectively. Um, and one thing to consider, um, the, the, the lower stage and your second stage is typically going to use about 30 to 40 percent less power, or need 30 to 40 percent less power from the motor as the high stage needs. Um, but currently most systems are using the same compressor on both the high and the low stage. So how do we solve this problem? Well, one way is to use a full motion compressor that is both R290, or uses R290, and we simply uh, work with Thermal Fisher to apply it with R170. Um, so this is a highly efficient compressor, and it has what we call an overdrive feature um, with high reliability and low noise. So what are these benefits? Uh, you'll 
the uh, energy savings uh, through load matching of around 20 to 40 percent um, improvement in EER based on the application. So what it does under low demand situations, the compressor will operate at a lower speed, say 2,000 RPMs, and it keeps its run times longer because it's operating in a more energy efficient state than the fixed speed compressor would be as it's cycling between. Under a high demand situation, the compressor would ramp up its speed to help maintain temperature. And then if you go through a reload or if you have to go through a pull down, the compressor will overdrive itself to 4,000, 4,500 RPM to get through that pull down quicker. So basically, you're, if you take a look at your integrated average under the curve, your energy consumption is less than what it was with the fixed speed compressors. So this reduced pull down time, <coughs> typically we see about a 20% reduction in pull down time by overdriving the compressor, which is energy savings. Three, temperature control. Remember how I mentioned that the product is high value and very sensitive to temperature changes. Well, with the load matching, the compressor is able to run at a longer time, and you're able to maintain a more consistent temperature inside the cabinet which then gives you a more consistent product temperature at the end of the day. So, all that's the theoretical. So now I'm going to hand it over to Richard here, who's going to talk about um, what happened when they actually apply the compressor and the refrigerants in their cabinet. Good afternoon. I'd like to spend a few minutes telling you about our latest ultra-low cascade refrigeration system that we released that we call the TSX. John's given you a lot of good background information about perhaps the refrigerants that we selected and, uh, and the compressors that we used, uh, but I want to pull all that together a little bit and, uh, and give you a little bit more detail. Now, John just shared a calculation with us that showed, theoretically, we should be able to save about 15 to 20 percent energy savings by substituting natural refrigerants for more traditional refrigerants in the ultra low space like 404A and 508B. In the case of the TSX, we've actually been able to achieve up to about 50 percent energy savings by doing three key things. The decision to use natural refrigerants, in this case R290 and R170, we also employ variable speed compressors in both stages. Uh, in this case, it's the full motion by Embraco. And then we have to take a hard look at our algorithms. They need to become more responsive and they need to become intelligent. So a total revamp of our historic control algorithms. And as you can imagine, we believe that we've developed a very special ultra-low. And by special, what I mean is we've added customer value in seven key areas that I want to share with you. First, we have silent-like operation. This is a unit that you can actually have in your lab. You're not really going to notice it's there. We've had people walk by it already and wonder if it's on. We want to improve upon or maintain peak performance. We want to be environmentally friendly and responsible. We want to lead on cargo volumes. We also want independent certification. We need to have adaptive controls for in situ response. And lastly, we want to consume low energy. Now, a couple other points about the sustainability proposition that comes with the TSX that I want you to be aware of. First, it is manufactured now in a zero landfill factory. And that's been a goal of ours in Nashville for about five years now, and we've recently achieved it. Second, it actually uses water blown foam as well. So, John's not giving me time to go through all of the design goals. <laughs> so what I want to focus on is peak performance versus environmentally friendly. But I am going to lump low energy consumption under those, uh, under environmentally friendly. You know, oftentimes I think a lot of designers think that those two goals have to be mutually exclusive. You can only really achieve on one, right, at the expense of the other. Well, if you think about your recent experience, I'm going to give you an auto analogy, forgive me, but 
20 years ago when you bought a car, you might have went to the lot and said, I want the muscle car or I want the commuter car. In your more recent conversations, you probably went to the lot and said, I want both, right? I need both of those attributes in my car. That's really what the TSX is trying to deliver on, both of those goals. I got a name for that. <laughs> we call that energy savings without performance compromise. Now, I've shared the energy savings number of TSX with you, but now let me go just a couple slides and show you some of the performance numbers <coughs> to maintain or improve upon. This first one is an everyday experience for our customers. Door open recovery. This is a standardized test for us. We run it at minus ABC set point. We open the door for 60 seconds, and that's all the doors, outer and inner. We close it, and we measure the response. Now you can see here that the TSX is clocking in at 24 minutes, and I'm here to tell you that that's very competitive in our market space, and it's on par with the legacy design that we have. Now, one way, uh, or one important attribute for holding this performance metric is leveraging the full motion overdrive assist. Last auto analogy, I promise. <laughs> so many of us have the experience of going down the highway, perhaps in our V6 with our families. And oftentimes, we'll notice the eco light on in our dash, perhaps. Well, in that case, perhaps only three cylinders are active. But yet, you provide a demand and it's easy to take the remaining cylinders and make them active and have that additional power. Likewise with the full motion compressor. When we have an introduction of a load or a door opening, we can throttle up the RPM and we can get additional cooling capacity. Now, it's really overdrive assist because you can achieve RPMs higher than typical single speed compressors. Turbo mode a little bit, if you will. Um, so we use that extensively in our door open recovery, and we were able to hold the line and maintain this key critical metric. Next, the TSX is 2.5 times quieter than our legacy design. <coughs> A couple key inputs to holding this attribute or this goal, RPM control of the compressors, as well as the fans, and then, of course, there's a lot of construction details that go into making that particular spec. The materials you, you select, the component layout that you choose, and, uh, and those torque specs that you need to be putting on your line to make sure that uh, you're controlling your build process. Just a couple more. In terms of other customer-facing customer performance, the TSX delivers <coughs> about a 60% improvement on temperature peak variation. We're clocking in at about plus or minus 3C at a minus 80C set point. 60% better. That's huge for our customers. If, if you've ever been out to an ultra low customer, some of the designs from five and 10 years ago, you open the door and they've actually blocked off one of the shelves or something because the peak variation, based on their testing, right, doesn't meet their protocol. So every time we can tighten up peak variation, and they can use all of our cargo space. Next, we maintain the 60,000 vial capability. Now that's important, that's 602 inch boxes in my space, in my world. <laughs> but it's very important that we have very dense storage for the footprint that the unit's gonna take. We deal with freezer repositories where it's basically cold air warehouse, right? Get as much in there as you can. So dense, the density of our storage is very important. We took this platform and put it out on our second largest ultra-low upright. And I think I covered door opening there. So the takeaway I want you to have about TSX is that it really delivers on both fronts. It's environmentally responsible, but it didn't back off on that performance metric either. And that's what we set out to do. It is currently for sale as a 50 hertz model, and we plan to offer a 60 hertz model later this summer. A couple other takeaways. These have more to do with the ultra low space in general. The first one's kind of obvious after this presentation, but you can be successful with natural refrigerants in the ultra low space. Right? No reason to shy away from them. 
You can be successful, you can have better energy performance, and you can maintain and improve upon some of your other performance metrics. We fully expect to see additional natural refrigerant integration into our market space. I think one of the telltales of that is that the EPA has already developed a standardized energy test so that we can benchmark <coughs> energy consumption across varied ultra-low products. And lastly, when you make that decision to bring natural refrigerants into your design, I would encourage you to look at other elements of your design to try to enhance the effect, to get a synergy. For us, it was about looking at variable speed compressors and taking a hard look at the algorithms we had used historically. But really what you're trying to do there is, is do more. Don't just change the gas. That's important, no doubt. But look at something else you can do to maximize that customer value add. 